Hello and welcome back to What If, where we take a look at the strange What If and Elseworlds stories from Marvel and DC Comics. Today, we are finally concluding Superman and Batman Generations with its fourth issue. This book has been a wild ride of emotional ups and downs, so let's see how it inevitably ends. It is now 1999. The head of the demon sits upon his throne, Talia al Ghul standing behind him. Batman stands, flanked by guards, and demanding to know where his father, who had disappeared 20 years ago in search of the League of Assassins, is. But the head of the demon just laughs, telling Batman that he has no desire to make him disappear like his father did, but instead wishes the young man to take his place. He stands, motioning the Dark Knight to follow him, and leads him into the next room. In another chamber, the demon's head motions to the Lazarus Pit, explaining that it has been more than two decades since anyone has stood in this room. Bruce Wayne once stood here with Ra's al Ghul. On that day, an offer was made. They would both enter the pit together, with one of them giving up their life force so that the other may become immortal. Of course, the decision wasn't really up to Bruce. If he disagreed, Ra's would just have his men kill him. Realizing that he had no real choice, Wayne stripped down and stepped into the pit with his nemesis. Roz began to scream in pain, trying to get free of the pit, but Wayne held him back. They both submerged, with Talia running to try and aid her father. Suddenly, though, an arm shot free, and it grasped for Talia's hand. Back in the present, as he finishes his story, the head of the demon removes his mask before Bruce Wayne Jr., revealing himself to be the young man's father. BJ is shocked, stunned to discover that his father is the head of the League of Assassins. Not only that, but now he's immortal. The Batman-turned-demon's head shows his son around. In the last 20 years, he has taken Roz's empire and turned it into a force for good in the world. Finally, he explains to BJ that he wishes for him to take over the empire for one simple reason. The call of adventure has never quite been sated in his new role. He misses being Batman. Cut to Gotham. Bruce Wayne is once again gliding over the city streets, a smile emblazoned on his face. Far below, he sees a man being mugged. He leaps down, quickly disarming him. The man is shocked, but not for the usual reason. He believed Batman had left Gotham after Superman was imprisoned almost 10 years ago. I did leave Gotham for a while, friend, but you can be the first to tell everyone the Batman is back on the beat, he exclaims, leaping back off into the night. Bruce is struck with a thought, though. He moves through the city, finding the building where the Phantom Zone projector is being held. Believing that Clark has served his time, he quickly activates it. Batman, you've changed your uniform since the last time I saw you, Superman exclaims, emerging from his prison and standing before Bruce. But Bruce reveals his identity, explaining that his son no longer serves as the Dark Knight. Shocking, Clark. Both men turned, greeting another young costumed hero as he enters the room. Ah, you must be Nightwing, Bruce asks, seeing his grandson in a stark black and white suit. The young man nods, explaining that Bruce Jr. contacted him and told him of his grandfather's arrival. Superman steps forward, smiling at the man that is actually his grandson. You are a fine heir to the House of El, he tells the boy. Bruce turns to his friend, believing they had agreed to not tell the boy of his true parentage, so that he would not go insane like Clark's son. But Superman tells them that they don't need to worry about that anymore. Quickly, the three men head to Lex Luthor's old lair, which is now surrounded by a big green bubble. It is there, of course, to stop anyone from breaking inside and discovering what horrors that Lex Luthor has cooked up. Luckily, Kyle Rayner arrives, who took over as Green Lantern when Alan Scott retired, and he lets them in. Moving through the halls, Clark explains that the Ultra Humanite, or the man they knew as Lex, always talked about taking Superman's body, even after he tried to remove his powers with the Gold Kryptonite. Batman nods, understanding that there possibly is a cure from the kryptonite's effects somewhere in these halls. Shortly thereafter, they find a vial that could contain their solution. With zero hesitation, Superman drinks the liquid, and in a matter of moments, his powers return to their full strength. With his microscopic vision, Superman is able to see the elements that make up the cure, and because he's super smart, of course, he quickly makes a new sample. He turns to Nightwing explaining to the man that he will gain powers like Superman if he drinks the serum. Nightwing is stunned. What a day he's had, not only discovering his true heritage, but also being offered power unimaginable. He tells the others he has to think about it, taking the vial with him. A month later, however, Nightwing flies down to land by both Bruce and Clark, now truly an heir to the House of El. You really mean to go through with this? Bruce asks his old friend. Clark nods, explaining that he had a lot of time to think in his 10 years in the Phantom Zone. 
The Earth is filled with heroes that have stepped up in his absence. Clark has decided it's time for him to see more of the universe. It's time for Superman to go cosmic. Batman and Nightwing watch as long as they can, until Superman disappears. But Bruce knows, deep down, he'll see his friend again. Someday. Fast forward hundreds of years to 2919. A bat-shaped spaceship flies through the deep cosmos. Ahead lays a planet, bleak and desolate. Not unlike his old Fortress of Solitude back on Earth, Batman muses. He teleports down to the planet, confident that his suit will protect him. Looking around, though, he doesn't see anything that looks like a door. Suddenly, the floor begins to move, bringing him below. Bruce marvels at the collection that surrounds him as the elevator descends. It is you! I was halfway convinced my sensors must be giving me false readings! Superman, now draped in long white hair, shouts as he flies up to his old friend. Bruce laughs, telling his friend that he seems to finally be showing his age. He also explains that the power of the Lazarus Pit makes him age one year for every century. Clark leads Bruce through his new fortress, moving through the memories of his long life. Batman explains to his old friend that he left Earth 300 years ago, citing similar reasons as his old friend. The two admit that with all of the heroes bringing peace to the universe, their lives have grown boring. Clark offers the Dark Knight a drink, and Bruce leans back as the two begin to revel in old memories from their youth. Clark admits that it being 2919 got him thinking about their first meeting, but Bruce is confused, not sure why he would think about 1939 because of the year 2919. But Clark smiles. Oh, it wasn't that meeting I was thinking about. That was really our second meeting, Clark explains. We now flash back to 1929. A young Superboy flies over the rooftops of Gotham City, amazed at how much larger the city is than Smallville. Quickly, he lands at the Gotham Gazette and changes into his civilian clothes. Stepping inside, Clark is introduced by the editor to the other junior journalists that won the local contest that brought them all here, including one Lois Lane. Clark is, of course, immediately smitten with the young woman. After those introductions have been made, the editor introduces them to the Gazette's owner, Bruce Wayne. The young billionaire greets everyone, but is quickly interrupted as Lois questions why he would use his money to sponsor a journalism competition. Bruce smiles at her, explaining that his parents were taken from him nine years ago. Since then, he has used his money to help the people of Gotham City, but he doesn't think it's enough. He believes the good people of Gotham need an impenetrable wall to protect them, and the newspaper is one of the bricks. We need the best young minds in this country as the first line of defense, he explains. With these words, he smiles at the other winners and asks that they head out into the city to find a story. Clark and Lois decide to work together, walking through the city streets. Clark is still looking up at the vast buildings, amazed, but Lois tells him that Gotham holds nothing to Metropolis. Metropolis is where I'm heading. I only came on this corny junket so I could get some print that would impress the editors at the Daily Planet, she tells him. But, as if on cue, their conversation is cut short as they see a giant robot attacking a construction site. Using his x-ray vision, young Clark is surprised to see Lex Luthor piloting the machine. He pushes Lois into a doorway, running off and telling her that he's going to find help. In a matter of moments, Superboy is on the scene, dismayed to find that Lois didn't listen to him and is now in the clutches of Luthor's robot. Superboy leaps to attack but is knocked away by a thermal blast from the robot's cannon. Meanwhile, high in Wayne Tower, Bruce looks down on the destruction. He presses a button, calling his faithful servant Alfred into the room. Are you quite certain you wish to do this, Master Bruce? The man asks, holding up the new uniform. Bruce nods, telling the man that he's been training for this moment for years. In a matter of seconds, the young man is swinging down, dressed as the first Robin. Landing atop the robot, Robin orders Luther to let Lois go. The robot's arms try to swat the young hero aside, but Robin has landed in a perfect spot. I've calculated the arc of your arms, and they can't touch me here, he laughs. Inside, Luther curses, having not calculated dealing with two costumed heroes. Not waiting for Robin to blow through the robot, Luther ejects, making his escape on a rocket bike. Superboy tries to give chase, but realizes that the robot is running amok behind him. He turns as he charges once more to the rescue. Quickly freeing Lois, Superboy flies up to the cockpit, where Robin informs him that the controls are fused and he can't stop the rampage. Superboy acts fast, flying the machine up into space and dropping it on the moon, where it can't hurt anyone. 
Except maybe people who live on the moon, which, which probably exist in this universe. Returning to Earth, finding Robin pulling Lois free of the robot's fallen arm, the hero and young reporter ask Robin who he is, but the young man shakes his head. I prefer to keep my identity a secret, just as you do, Superboy, he tells them. Lois nods, suggesting that they all work together to discover where Luther got this robot. Moving through the construction site, they find the remains of a large shipping container that might have held this machine. Superboy picks up the pieces, believing that he can use his microscopic vision to see trace materials on the wood. Robin nods, telling him that he can track down the whereabouts of the material if Superboy finds them. Somewhere near the lab of Stanislaw Erwin, Lois tells them simply. Both heroes are shocked, how could she know this? But she smiles and holds up a shipping label that was stuck to the box. The three move through the city, Robin on his motorcycle while Superboy flies above carrying Lois. Inside, they meet the old scientist. He explains that the man who they call Lex Luthor came to him as a lab assistant. He discovered that the young man was planning on using his robot to rob a bank, and so Stannis fired him. He didn't think anything of shipping the robot a week later. Superboy nods, telling the scientist, I would believe that story. Only if my super keen sense of smell wasn't detecting recently applied spirit gum in a really big rat, he shouts, pulling the disguise from Stannis, revealing him to be Luther after all. Luther rips off his jacket, revealing a gyro rig underneath. He grabs at Lois, pulling her as a hostage as he takes off. This is twice you've been in the wrong place at the wrong time. There shall not be a third, he shouts. Superboy tries to give chase, but Luther laughs and pulls out a piece of kryptonite but Robin twists a piece of metal, turning it into the perfect throwing weapon and launches it across the room. I can use something I learned in Australia two years ago, Bruce thinks. The weapon sails through the air, smacking into Luther's hand and knocking the kryptonite away. Robin manages to grab the kryptonite, putting it in a lead pipe. Luther, realizing that he might be defeated, throws Lois away. Luckily, Robin manages to catch her. And as Luther turns to continue fleeing, he is stopped by Superboy once more. Going somewhere, Lex? He asks. Superboy reaches out, snapping one of Lex's propellers. The villain plummets to the earth, but Superboy easily catches him. Later, the police arrive, carting Luther away in their paddy wagon. Superboy sighs. It makes me sad every time I see Luther hauled away. Such a great mind, gone bad, he tells the others. But Robin just shakes his head, telling the hero to save his compassion for someone who deserves it. An officer walks over, asking the kids if anyone needs a ride, and Lois raises her hand. But before I go, Here's a little something to remember me by, she says, pulling Superboy in for a kiss. Days later, young Clark Kent tells his parents that he has decided to move to Metropolis instead of Gotham City. But the family is interrupted as Pete Ross comes charging in, warning Clark that Lana Lang has gotten into magic once again. Oh, Lana, you and your magic. Back in the future of 2919, Bruce laughs that Clark had figured out that he was the first Robin. The two old friends sit and reminisce some more about the old days, both happy and sad that the generations after them have made the universe a peaceful place. Let's do something about it, Cal. The universe is a big place. There must be worlds, systems, maybe whole galaxies out there that still need a couple of old war horses like us, Bruce tells his friend, morphing back into his cowl. Clark nods, but tells his friend that it won't just be the two of them. Suddenly, Lana Lang lands next to Bruce. He shakes her hand in surprise as she explains that all of the magic that she messed around with eventually gave her immortality. Clark nods, explaining that she waited 700 years to find him. There was never a greater testimony to love, he smiles. Lana takes both their arms as the three friends walk through the fortress, smiles on their faces. There must be somewhere out there the three of us can get into trouble, she tells them. The trio start off, not knowing what awaits them out there in the great cosmos. And that is the conclusion of Superman and Batman Generations. Well, at least the first volume. Yes, like I mentioned in the previous episodes, there are two other volumes to this story, and we can get through those if you guys want to see them. We're gonna take a break from the DC stuff for a bit here at What If Though and do some Marvel stories, but if you wanna see this universe continue here on the channel, let us know in the comments. I hope you all enjoyed this series. I personally think it's a lot of fun, if not incredibly hokey at times. I mean, 2919, 1929, come on, that like, you're reaching a bit there. <laughs> The second and third issues of this book are definitely where this initial run shines, but who knows? Maybe the sequels are just as good, if not better. I wouldn't put my money on that. On that. I haven't read them yet, but, you know, again, who knows? Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you all next time with Marvel Universe The End! Be sure to catch that. I'll see you guys then. Thanks for watching.